Lecture 3, The Doctrine of Inspiration. In our opening lecture, we understood the foundations of revelation. What does it mean that God has spoken? And we gave just exactly that definition of revelation. God has not left us in the dark. We are not stuck wondering what is true or how we ought to live in this world. God has spoken. He has spoken clearly. He has spoken sufficiently. We can know how we ought to conduct ourselves as human beings. In our last lecture, we extended that discussion of revelation to talk about what revelation actually looks like. And in the process, we discovered a, a vast array, an immense amount of diversity in how God has revealed himself so that we can talk about God as the ultimate source of truth. But from that, we can talk about his revelation universally in creation, what we see all around us. And we can talk about special or redemptive revelation, God speaking directly to specific people, recording his words, down to the climactic expressions of revelation, Christ, the embodied word, scripture, the written word. In this lecture now, we will go further to talk about that, that, that climactic revelation, scripture, the written word. And in the process, we want to explore is, is how it's possible or how we could even explain a kind of a, a basic model for understanding what it means that God has spoken in his written word. How has he spoken? What has he spoken? How did this work? And some of the core questions here would be how we think about the author of scripture, as in who has written these words. Let me give you an introductory kind of um, introductory question. So I, at one point, was preaching and uh, talking through different passages, and I made comments like, here in this passage, David said, or Paul said, or Samuel said, that kind of thing. And someone took a little bit of issue with me on that to say, you shouldn't say that David said, or Saul said, or Samuel said, or Paul said. You ought to say God said. So is that, is that a valid concern? I mean, after all, Scripture is not the invention of Saul or Samuel or David. It's, it's God's words. So should we then be really careful to make sure that in our communication about God's words, we say it just like that? These are God's words, not David's words. Or Samuel's words. And to set that foundation, let's think a little bit about the, the process or the development of inspiration, how we see this concept laid out before us in scripture. I'm going to start off with some foundations for thinking about inspiration. And one of the most beautiful foundations for this, it starts off very early, Exodus 32. This is the place where God is speaking to Moses while he's on Mount Sinai. Down below, in the, uh, the valley below, the people are actually worshiping false idols. They've built the, the golden calf, and now they're dancing around it, worshiping this false deity. Meanwhile, if you're reading through the previous chapters, back in chapter 31 and before, God has spoken his words to Moses. God has recorded his law or his expectations about how Moses ought to conduct himself and how the people ought to conduct themselves. And then we get this really interesting insight that sets the foundation for inspiration. Moses turned, he went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. These were tablets written on both sides, on the front and on the back they were written. Now, watch this. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. That, I think, sets an important foundation here. A foundation for inspiration starts out here. Who has written these words? And the answer is none other than the writing or the finger of God. God has written this engraved in stone. A couple of further um, assessments or a couple of further insights we can make about this. It is very significant here that God himself is writing in these words. So we discover now that God speaks. We've seen that from the very beginning, all the way back to the Garden of Eden. God speaks, but it's not just that he speaks. He also writes. And as we have discussed in previous sections, 
this writing notion is significant because of how it makes it permanent, how it makes it public. Anyone now can go and read God's words. Anyone can see that God has said this and it stands and it is authoritative as though it were a written contract, literally engraved in stone. God has spoken. God has written. But if you move outward from this, then you're going to discover now that God is writing not just his own writing, but he's actually taking up the writing or he's using the writing of Moses. Let's look at that. Exodus 17, 14, the Lord says to Moses, write this down, write it as a memorial, recite it. So moving on, Exodus 24, another chapter, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. See, but pause and look at some of this language. You've got Moses writing down the words of the Lord. The Lord says to Moses, cut again two tablets. I will write on the tablets again, the words of the first tablets. These are the ones that were broken earlier in the passage we just read. Well, now when these words are written down, the Lord's saying to Moses, write down these words. Moses is recording the words of the Lord. Moses is writing down all of what God has told him to write down. Moses wrote this law down. He gave it to the priests. Moses wrote down this song the same day. And far into the future, Joshua, they will write down on stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. Okay, but pause. Process out the connections here. God is the one who originally wrote with his own finger in stone. It's the words of God himself written down in stone. But as you're moving forward, you're discovering it's the words of Moses recording the words of God. So the link becomes that the source is ultimately God. The recording of it through Moses, writing down what God had spoken, the result of which at the end, it's possible now legitimately to talk about this as God's words or to talk about it as the words that Moses authentically wrote. Moses wrote them down, but they are ultimately God's words. That's going to become a very critical foundation or pattern as we move further on into the New Testament and across our whole vision of Scripture. Let's keep on going, though. Moses continues this process of writing. So when I move now to Joshua 24, they've entered the land, and now they are, they are following God's words or the commands that Moses had recorded. And we're going to find this now as a pattern. Joshua wrote down these words in the book of the law. And the words that he wrote down now are the statutes that Moses had originally written, but now Joshua is writing them. Okay, so we're following out the pattern. God originally wrote, Moses recorded. Now Joshua is writing again these words. And if we keep on moving deeper into the Old Testament, we're going to find that other authors are writing like this. Isaiah 30, God tells Isaiah, go, write before them on a tablet, inscribe it in a book. Isaiah is to write down the words of God. Jeremiah is to write in a book all the words that I have spoken to you. Ezekiel is to write down the the record of all of this. And there's supposed to be a record so that they will see and, and know what God has spoken. Write it down in their sight. There's, in fact, a broader pattern that works like this. And it's the pattern with declares the Lord stretching across the entire Old Testament. Here, I'm not going to be able to read this to you because it's so many passages. I just want to impress you with it. How many times we have this kind of language, declares the Lord, as I live, declares the Lord, declares the Lord. And if we just scroll down here, I'm just going to pull it through just to impress you how many instances of this we have. It's huge. It's a really massive theme. I've not yet reached halfway in the number of references. In fact, let, let's make this as small as we can, and we'll just we'll just scan down through, again, t- kind of to get the general impression of how much this happens across Scripture. It's almost exhausting in its breadth. But this is a very defining, that's halfway, this is a very defining pattern of the Old Testament. And for this pattern, 253 verses. What we have implied over and over again is that God is speaking ultimately behind the words of his messengers, the prophets, or the authors, the human authors 
of Scripture. And just think about for a moment, Isaiah stands in front of you. And Isaiah says, thus declares the Lord. And if someone at that point says, Isaiah, no, it's you. You're not the Lord. It's Isaiah. So which are we talking about? Are we talking about Isaiah speaking? Or are we talking about the Lord speaking? Part of the doctrine of inspiration or part of the way that Scripture all the way through, even from Exodus up into the prophets, the way that Scripture itself is going to speak of it is God has spoken through his prophets. So that when Isaiah stands up and says, thus declares the Lord, you can say, yes, these are Isaiah's words or Isaiah is speaking, but you've missed it if you don't also recognize that behind it and more ultimate, more foundational, more basic and more core, God is speaking through these words. This continues into the New Testament. So Jesus is the word of God. And we've seen that before, the word embodied. And when Jesus speaks, he is by definition speaking God's words because he is, in fact, God. There's a really interesting pattern with this, though, linking Jesus' words to the Father's words. So Jesus will talk about the fact that his words are the Father's words. Anyone who hears my words, the the words that you hear, they're not just mine. I think that's the way that you want to understand this kind of language. It's not only Jesus' words. But it's more ultimately the Father's words that are being spoken. And in fact, then, it is an expression of loving Jesus or obeying Jesus and following Jesus that you would both hear his words, accept his words, and here, the language we have in two different places here, keep his words. Keeping Jesus' words, keeping the Father's words, keeping God's words. These words are not Um, up for consideration. They're not up for one's own decision about whether you want to follow or not. God has spoken. Jesus relays those words. Jesus has spoken. You must obey. Now, watch where it follows from here, though. The Father speaking his words. Jesus faithfully speaking those words. John 14, 26 now. I have spoken these things while I am still with you. But now Jesus is about to leave. So how will we know God's words or hear God's words? The helper whom the Holy Spirit will send in my name, God, in the person of the Spirit, he will teach you all things. He will bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And here, critical to understand or critical to process what's being said here. Um, Jesus is, is not just promising that we will, like, walking down a path one day, we'll just suddenly, uh, uh, passages from scripture will pop into our minds. That that is part of, I suppose, the Holy Spirit's convicting us or applying his word to us. So, I mean, there could be a work of the Spirit like that. That's, That's not what's being expressed in this passage, though. What's being expressed in this passage is something thicker and very significant. And it is the apostles or the disciples of Jesus recording Jesus' words in the New Testament for the benefit and the sake of the church. So that, look again at the the language, that again is what's being said here. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send you in my, my, my name, he will teach you all things, bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you, recorded in the New Testament. The apostles will write down the teaching of Jesus. And what's so beautiful about that way of understanding is you realize now that the New Testament and scripture itself is not just the view of the apostles or the apostles carrying out the ideas that they would like to relate, but you realize that the New Testament is an expression or a record of Jesus' own teaching. When I read the New Testament, I'm hearing Jesus' words in it. Jesus is teaching me here. And the apostles' words, as recorded in the New Testament then, are just an expression or a reminder of what Jesus had said. When I read the New Testament, as we've said in other contexts, I am reading Jesus' teaching, recorded in the words of the apostles. One thing I'll call a special concern of mine is how much the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. And the reason I call it a special concern I'm a bit concerned sometimes that we might be blind to how much this is happening. 
I'm a bit concerned that we're not appreciating the, the degree or the breadth of this, that the New Testament is constantly drawing from the Old Testament. So I'm just going to scroll down through. Here's a passage of scripture. I'm in Romans 8, going through 9 and 10. Look at the bold. And I'm, I'm just, uh, of course, not asking you to read this. I'm just wanting you to see how much the bold is here. That bold is everywhere where the New Testament has quoted the Old Testament. And if I just keep on going through Romans 9 into Romans 10, you can see that vast portions of the chapter are actually pulled right out of the Old Testament. I'm reading these passages and maybe not understanding or recognizing that I'm reading the New Testament, yes, but actually for vast portions, I'm reading the Old Testament. Here's another passage that looks like this. This is 1 Peter 2. Within one passage and just a handful of verses, I have most of this section actually taken from Scripture. What comes in between is just uh, kind of piecing it together as Scripture said or as it is written. Another passage that works this way is the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, starting off and you have vast amounts of quotation just lifted right out of the Old Testament. These bold sections, I think, call that to your mind. There's a graphic way of representing this. So this is a graph showing you the different New Testament books, which are along the one side, and the other side is the Old Testament books. These Old Testament books are now connected by strings or lines across. And it's just to highlight that as you're reading the New Testament, the connections are constant between the two. New Testament and Old Testament are linked together. Here's one more illustration of that. In this case, what I've done on one side, I've written New Testament passages. On the other side, I've written Old Testament passages. And again, just strings that are going across to show you how deeply these are all inter interwoven. The point of all of this, as I read the pattern from God writing in his, with his hand into stone, Moses now recording the words of God, later Joshua, and now Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel speaking, thus says the Lord, all the prophets actually, that pattern is a very strong pattern, speaking the words of the Lord. But all of them, the prophets pointing forward, the New Testament reminds us, and prophesying the coming of the Messiah. So from Moses to Joshua to prophets now to Messiah and Jesus saying, my, my apostles will speak my words. They will record what I have spoken. And when the apostles speak, they draw from Jesus' words. They draw from the Old Testament. They draw from all of scripture. All of it comes together. Then you recognize there's a direct line across. God has spoken through human messengers, through his son, all of it tied together. The New Testament giving us the vision of the words of God spoken through human mouths. That takes me to talk about what I will call the key passages on inspiration. And I'll start out with 2 Samuel 23. So it's intentionally an Old Testament passage that I'm starting with. And this is so striking because of, as we've seen elsewhere, the confluence, the overlap, the interweaving of God's words and human words. 2 Samuel 23 David writes, or David reflects to say, that the words of the Lord have been spoken. The spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. In fact, if we put that into the, the larger context of the rest of the passage, we're going to actually see that this is thickly intertwined. So I've got language like this. The last words of David, the oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the anointed of the God of God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. Okay, can you see multiple expressions here? These are David's words. David has spoken. But now watch, when David speaks, it's not just David's words, but it's the Spirit of the Lord speaking by me. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me. Who is speaking? God or David? See, and the, the passage answers yes. In fact, I can go back to this way of expressing or representing the passage, and, and I can highlight, let's just look at the different sides, David's words versus God's words, looking like this. In the blue, these are the words of David. David speaks. He speaks by me. It's on my tongue. In the green, it's the words of God. The Spirit of the Lord speaks. His word is what's happening here. 
A couple of insights I'd like to make out of this passage. Notice the number of times you have the language of utterance or the, the, the word has been uttered. These are David's utterances. So here, the last words of David, the oracle, the oracle, the oracle of David. Um, this word oracle is utterance or declaration. And it means a revelation, but it's the kind of the concept of God revealing, God speaking. It's the same language as the declares the Lord language that we just saw across the Old Testament. So the really interesting thing is you can look at a, a statement from David and you can say, thus declares the Lord. And you can also say, thus declares David. The oracle thus declares David, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the utterance or the declaration of the man who was raised on high. David, but it's also God's words. And as we've been developing here within one passage, God speaks, but David also speaks. Whose words are these? Both David's words and God's words. One last point. If I notice the language carefully, the spirit of the Lord speaks by me. There is, I guess, a distinction of um, ultimacy. By ultimacy, I mean who is the final, final, final author. And as we're going to talk about in just a moment from another passage, it, though we can talk about God as the author and the human author, and both are true, there's no division between the two. At the same time, they're not true in the same way, or they're not, they're not equal in this sense. God's words come before the human words. God's words are more ultimate than the human words. God's words are the ultimate source behind the human words. So that it's not as though the human speaks and then after that, okay, now that becomes the divine words. But it's that God's words were already the ground. And then the human expressed what God wanted to be said. That takes me to the next passage that I'm calling a key passage on inspiration. 2 Samuel 23 is one that you ought to know. And a second passage, 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21. Okay, now watch the pattern or the, the, the model for inspiration here. Knowing that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. I should talk about this word interpretation first. When we hear interpretation, what we're assuming sometimes is how we would read a passage and then kind of how we would understand it. As though I have my interpretation, you have yours, and he has his interpretation. And so the Catholic Church has used this in the past to say that, that your individual member of the church should not have their own interpretation. The church will interpret for us. Or even for others, the focus of this would be on that interpretation process. I don't think that's the right understanding of this passage. The better way to understand this is focused on the apostles or the original authors of scripture. No prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own viewpoint. It's not just their take on things. The prophecy of scripture is not Paul porting out or giving out, bloviating about what things are important to him today. These are not Paul's opinions written in the text. And these are not Peter's opinions just thrown out there. They're not of private origination. And that fits, I think, really well and naturally with the, the flow or the reading of the rest of the passage. Because no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I could do the same kind of coloring in the words here if we wanted to. Let's just notice the language of the humans. Men spoke. I mean, they authentically spoke. And they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This concept of carried along, it, it we shouldn't really overcomplicate it. It's just the idea, I, maybe I walk over and I pick up a box, I carry it somewhere and I set it back down. Moving one thing from one place to another. Well, the people then are clearly involved. The people speak. See, but there's something richer in this. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. The humans did not decide what would be put in, put in here on their own. People spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So our reading of this passage would basically just be this. The ideas are God's ideas, not people's ideas. That they're not originated in the human's own thinking. It's not something that Paul came up with 
These words are sourced in God's thought. I'm reading here God's thoughts. A third passage, 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Now I'll start a little bit earlier than we might naturally be inclined to, because I want you to see this. Continue in the things, Paul says, that you have learned and have firmly believed. How from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. He's referring to the Old Testament. because That's all he had. I mean, the New Testament hadn't been written or completed yet. The sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I think it's really beautiful that Timothy can be growing up in the Old Testament that points to Jesus. And now Paul is going to continue to explain that. Verse 16. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. A couple of things then that I need to talk about or that we ought to recognize about what he's saying here. Number one, notice the universal focus of the passage. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's universal. It completes everything. I think in context with the point we just made that Timothy has the Old Testament, this is an important corrective for our temptation maybe to downgrade the Old Testament. That's just the Old Testament. Let's read the New Testament. No, all scripture. And when Paul's writing this, he's really talking about primarily the Old Testament, but it extends to all of scripture. All scripture is breathed out by God. All of it. Second, the language of breathe out, it's actually a single word, God breathed. Um, the concept of it would just be this, God's breath, God's words, God's voice. So when I am reading scripture, what I'm reading is words that were breathed out by God. I mean, it's, if you wanted to make this tangible, if you wanted to, 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 to have a, a sense of feeling it. It's almost as if, you know, you speak and you hold your hand in front of your mouth and you feel the breath coming from your mouth as you speak. Okay, that. The process of making sound. The scripture is God's words spoken out. You're reading here God's voice, God's words. Feel the vibrations. Feel the air hitting your finger. God speaking. That's scripture. The interesting thing about this, we're calling this lecture the a lecture about the doctrine of inspiration, right? And though that is the word we ought to use for talking about this doctrinal discussion, the word inspiration is an English word might actually mislead us a little bit. The word inspiration, I think to us, tends to sound like someone is uh, sitting in a corner somewhere, sitting, let's say, sitting by a lake, and they're, 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 they see the blue sky and they hear the sound of the water and some birds fly over and suddenly they're inspired. They have a very powerful emotional moment. They start writing things down. And as we read their words, we go, wow, what inspiration they had when they wrote, the, wrote these words. And on the contrary, what we're supposed to instead be thinking is quite actually quite opposite. Inspiration is the notion that these are not, this is not a creative moment in the human author's life where the human author had a, a strong feeling and they just poured out their feelings at that moment. It's actually the emphasis that God is the source. God is the origination point for all of this information. If you remember a, the diagram that we created way back, and we talked about the different aspects of revelation. So we have universal, we have redemptive. And then we talked about the climactic expressions of revelation in Christ and in scripture. One of the emphases we made here at the top of the diagram, remember, is that God is the source of truth. So if we're talking here about the bottom of the diagram, scripture, the written word, God is the source for all of that. It all comes from him. So come back then to our passage. And if we're processing this out, the question goes, how do we think about scripture? Scripture is breathed out by God, given to us God's words so that we can then live profitably. And that takes me to the last point I'd like to make from this passage. Just notice that because it is God's words, then it is relevant to every part of life. 
It's relevant or it's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness. So if I go further up in, this, in the passage, I'm seeing the reminder up here that this scripture is able to make you wise for salvation through faith. God's words are precious, and because they are God's words then, it guarantees its relevance and its authority for every part of life. Let me take you back to one of the questions I was asking a bit ago. And the question went, when I open up scripture, am I reading God's words or human words? Or how do I think about that? Could I could I say a passage from Romans? Could I say, well, Paul wrote this? Or should I only ever say God wrote this? And I would like to address that a little more deeply now. I think we're in a position where we've talked about this enough. I think now you know the answer to the question. But I'd like to show you the pattern more broadly across Scripture, just to show you some example passages here, where I have language of the divine author, or God speaking, and I have the human author as well. Let's start off with the human author. I have language of what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. What was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, David in the spirit calls him or says. This was what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. This was fulfilling the words of Isaiah. By the mouth of David, the Holy Spirit spoke. The words of the prophets agree. Moses writes, Isaiah prophesied of you. The prophets and Moses said. So in these kinds of examples here, is this fair enough to say? I have a lot of passages that illustrate or affirm that the authors, the human authors of scripture, authentically said these things. It is, to answer my question earlier, completely fair and legitimate for me to point to Romans and say, Paul wrote this. For me to point to Deuteronomy and say, Moses wrote this. Isaiah wrote this. Jeremiah wrote this. I can say those things legitimately, and I'm not undermining inspiration because scripture itself talks that way. I mean, if scripture is willing to say that Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses wrote this, then it's perfectly legitimate and warranted for me to also say those same things. But if I build that thought out further, I'm going to discover there's an an additional pattern. The additional pattern is not just that the human authors have spoken, but I'm going to discover also that the divine author has spoken. It is not only one-sided. And for that, then, let's look at another set of passages that do the opposite side here. These passages are going to now emphasize God's authorship. As indeed he says in Hosea, which is so interesting, because he's, he's, he's recognizing a location in the prophet Hosea, but it's God who is saying this. Or another passage like this. Have you not read what was said to you by God? Who said this? God said this. No, what he's citing here is a passage from Moses, but it's God ultimately who authored it. Here, this was appointed by him who said, or Jesus was appointed by him who said to him. So God speaking and appointing Jesus Christ and, and in his authority. As God also says in another place, God commanded. The wisdom of God said. What God promised to the fathers, God also says in another psalm, and God testified and said. All right, so on one side, I'm recognizing that I have human authorship. On the other side, I'm recognizing that God's voice stands behind it all. And the other set of passages I'll just put in the middle is a set of passages that do both. One of them we looked at just a little bit ago. Uh, I've got the wrong reference on here, but this is from 2 Samuel 23. The last words of David, the spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. Or here, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the men of God spoke, but ultimately the Holy Ghost was the author. What the Lord had spoken by the prophet. See, I've got both human and divine in there, right? The Lord had spoken by a human author. Or one more, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, this was said by the Holy Spirit, Acts 4.24. And actually, pardon me, one more, to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Do you see the framework for this then? The green words are to say that there is legitimate human authorship. The blue is to say that actually this is divine authorship. 
And the red in the middle is to recognize that both are true. Both can stand together. They're not in contradiction. Or to summarize it like this, these are God's words spoken by human messengers. Both are true, divine authorship and human authorship. You can even find this in some cases with very specific words and very specific passages. So, for instance, you have language like this. Um, God spoke one set of commands, honor your father and mother. So the question goes, who commanded that? And with the very same words, I can recognize that God commanded saying this, honor your father and mother, Matthew 15. But in a parallel passage, Moses said, honor your father and mother. And these are parallel. It's possible to look at the very same words, honor your father and mother, and talk about that as God saying it or Moses saying it. Both are entirely true. This takes us to a final question for this lecture. And that is just what, what was the experience for the apostles or for the other authors of scripture? In other words, what did psychologically, what did they experience or what did this feel like? And we're naturally very interested in this question because we want to imagine a model or we want to somehow wrap our minds around what this might look like. It's also just one of these things that we, I think, naturally incline towards in our imaginations. This is Rembrandt, and it's supposed to be the inspiration of the Apostle Matthew, but it's an angel standing behind Rembrandt's shoulder, and the angel kind of whispering into his ear what he's supposed to write down. And, and that kind of is a model, maybe should we just substitute in the Holy Spirit for the angel? Is, is Matthew sitting there writing down just word for word what God has given him to write? Is he in a kind of a trance-like state? So when they're under inspiration, like kind of a sense of there's a time when you're in and there's a time when you're out. And so when you're in, then you just, you feel it, you know, and it's this exotic, exhilarating kind of feeling as you put down God's words. Those kinds of questions. What's going on here? What was this like? And a couple of, of comments I think we ought to make. Number one, it's fascinating that scripture itself is almost entirely unconcerned with this question. In other words, when you read the passages, such as the core passages we looked at earlier, scripture basically just tells you that it happened doesn't really give you any kind of explanation for a how or how this would have worked or felt or something. It's just, it happened. It basically focuses on the results more than the actual process itself. Or said differently, scripture isn't really concerned with, nor I would suggest, should we be that concerned with the emotional or psychological experience of inspiration, what it felt like for an apostle to go through this process. It doesn't really matter, honestly. But there are some things we can say. There are passages, a handful of them, where it's apparent that God more or less dictated his words. So you've got instances in Moses' experience when he's writing down the laws of God, and it's just explicit. The Lord said to Moses, write this down. There are other places that work like this in Daniel or in Revelation, where it's, it's the book of Revelation, where it's more or less just what we might call dictation, as though I, kind of like the angel whispering in Matthew's ear, the, the person stands there and says, this is what to write, and you just write it down word for word. But as a whole, in general, I think the way we're supposed to think about inspiration is far more human or far more natural than we might otherwise be inclined to think. And a couple of really interesting examples like this. Habakkuk. If you read through the book of Habakkuk, you get a very fascinating dialogue back and forth. Uh, Habakkuk will throw out questions or challenges or concerns or struggles, and God answers him back. And so the dialogue between Habakkuk and God going back and forth is what forms the content of the book. And therefore, what you're reading is very much explicitly, openly, right there, the psychological or the, the struggling process of Habakkuk. It's, it's not removing him somehow 
from the struggle or the difficulty. He's, he's walking through it and you're reading his struggle. There are cases in um, several of the epistles that maybe at times might have thrown you off. For instance, here in Romans, you have the comment at the end of the book that there's an author, a human author, and it's not, it's not Paul. So here's the comment, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. And you, you might scratch your head a little bit wondering what's going on here. I thought Paul wrote the letter. That's illustrating what's happening here, but could probably happen in several other New Testament epistles. Definitely happened in the case of Jeremiah. And that is that some of the authors of scripture used a secretary or a person who would write down write it down for them. I recognize that at the time, uh, writing is a lot more laborious than it is today. We can pull out our ballpoint pen, our perfectly smooth paper, and we just start writing and everything goes. But if you're thinking of writing as a kind of a, it's an art form, it's a trade. And so the person gets a quill pen or they might use some other kind of method and they've got to scrape it down. You can watch videos about this on YouTube. They've got to get it just down to a fine point, but fine enough that it will write well without breaking. And they mix up their own ink and they've got to keep the ink uh, soft enough, or liquid enough, but not too liquid. And then they're doing their writing, but the paper's going to be rough. And so you've got to try to get it just right and struggle. It's a lot of work. And now what you, I think, what, what you're supposed to imagine or recognize is that it was common for an author to sit down or maybe walk around and he's speaking out loud the words that someone's to write. And the secretary is writing it down on their behalf. It's dictation. They're writing it down. And now then I think a vision could be of Paul walking back and forth and he's, he's thinking through his words, he's saying his words, and the secretary is writing them down. In terms of a, a systematic theology category, we would say that God providentially guided both the words of Paul and the writing of the secretary to get his words down accurately. And so that inspiration extends to both, actually. But by inspiration, what we're talking about is God sovereignly guiding the person as they write. And that, I think, gives us a little bit of a window into this being a, a, a rather human, natural, real world kind of experience. It's not as though when Paul is writing Romans, he's in a trance. You know, this is actually Paul thinking out loud. He's working through his ideas. He's saying these things as he goes. And where we'll head to in just a second. God is sovereignly guiding those thoughts to reach exactly the conclusion that Paul is supposed to, to make. Two other instances that I think are just helpful and interesting. Revelation 10 is a case of what I earlier called dictation, more, more or less. Or maybe better to say, um, John is receiving the revelation and he's writing it down and God's just telling him, here's the next thing, write this down, write this down, and so on. Well, John receives a vision and part of that vision now is the seven thunderings. Already, John has recorded the seven, uh, the seven seals. And a little bit later, he's going to record the seven trumpets. Or he's already started to record the trumpets. And later, he'll record the bowls. So he's done this already. And when he's received other sets of sevens, then he's recorded them. That's just what he was supposed to do. In fact, God told him, write these things down. So here comes another revelation. Here come the seven thunderings. And the comment goes in verse 4, when John heard these, I was about to write. And a voice from heaven said, seal up what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. What I think is fascinating here. John is, he's conscious, he's aware, he's thinking. I mean, he's reaching conclusions about what he should or shouldn't write. And it's, it's a very normal, conscious, aware, thinking human process. And in fact, in the process of writing some of this down, he makes a wrong assumption. Okay, I assume I'm supposed to write this down as well. And God's answer to him, no, not that. Stop there. I don't want you to write any more beyond that. It gives us, a, again, a fascinating window into the, the psychologizing or the conscious awareness of those who were even writing these things down. I mentioned this previously, but let's go back here. Daniel chapter 12, yet another fascinating example where you have a biblical author writing down the different things that he's been told. And 
Uh, Daniel, after all of this, is wondering about what all, the, all of this means. So Daniel here comments in verse 8, I heard, but I did not understand. And Daniel asked, oh my Lord, what is the outcome of these things? And the angel, which probably is actually Jesus Christ, so the messenger of the Lord, answers to him, go your way. The words are shut up and sealed. Okay, another example of an author who is actually writing these things down but they're having their own mental processes. They're thinking and they're wondering, what is, what is the meaning of this? And that is part of the total package of what God is leading them to do. A final example, 1 Corinthians 1, 14 to 16. One of the most fascinating, I think, to me. And in this case, what we find is Paul trying to remember what he had done. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any of you should say, that I baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Now, this is a, a reading of the passage I can't absolutely prove, but I feel fairly safe in saying. You've got an intervening gap in here. And Paul's comment, I baptized no one but Crispus and Gaius. And then the comment, so that no one could say that I baptized in my own name. I would argue or suggest here that as Paul is proceeding down through the passage, verse 16, it, it's like it occurs to him, oh, and I did also baptize the house of Stephanus. Okay, and I baptized also the house of Stephanus. And then he's pausing. Was there anybody else? I don't think there was anyone else. Okay, well, besides that, I don't know whether I baptized any other. <laughs> I can't remember. I'm not sure. This is a critical reminder as we read the New Testament. The apostles are not writing from a, a, a position of omnip omniscience. It's not that they remember or know everything at these moments. I, I've heard comments before, particularly, let's say, in respect to the rapture and the timing of the rapture. And someone will say, well, I mean, surely Paul knew when Jesus Christ was returning. And so why didn't he just say? And if he had known, he would have just inserted it right there. And that completely misunderstands the role of the apostles. Of course they don't know everything just because they're under inspiration. Of course they don't know everything because they're writing down God's words. They are limited in their mental processes just as we are. I mean, they're finite as they write these. They continue to be humans. And they continue to have one thought followed by another or to be thinking through things Okay, let's, okay, phrase it this way. I mean, they're, they're continuing to think it through like that as normal humans would, writing it down. Okay, here's the miracle of it, though. As they are processing through and writing down these words like a normal human would, God is sovereignly guiding their thinking so that the words they write down are exactly what he always intended for them to say give you a little bit of a parallel to that. This fits in with our discussions of the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. I mean, psychologically speaking, I have the experience of making free choices. And biblically speaking, theologically speaking, we have to affirm that the choices we make are real, authentic, meaningful, significant, important choices. Our choices matter. They are real. And we also affirm that there are no accidents, that the sovereign hand of God is in control of everything. Nothing has ever happened once in the history of the world to which God said, oh no, didn't see that coming. He always knew, he always planned. And in the same way, as the authors of scripture wrote down the words that God, or that wrote down the words they wrote in these books, words that were part of their own mental processes, God was sovereignly guiding their thinking to put down exactly what he always intended them to say. From eternity past, God knew what his word would be down to the last detail. He knew from Genesis to Revelation, every single word that would be there. He planned it all. He determined that this would be written and not that. This must be said and not that. All of that was in his sovereign plan. And he brings the human authors in. And they write down through the normal human mental processes. And the miracle of it is when they get done writing what they have written, 
is God's perfect words, the words he always intended. We could put some of this into a couple of specific examples. So I'll give two. Think of Isaiah 45. And in Isaiah, you have this comment about uh, Cyrus. He's going to come. He's going to fulfill all of God's words, or all of God's intentions. Now, this is several hundred years before Cyrus has even been born. And yet it's already been prophesied where God will say, Cyrus is my shepherd. He will fulfill all my purpose. He will do everything I intended. This is God's intention. The Lord says to his anointed to Cyrus, this is what I will have you to do. You will subdue nations. You will open doors before you. You will fulfill my word. All right, the remarkable thing, Cyrus doesn't yet exist. He hasn't yet been born. There is no Cyrus as of yet. And yet God can already speak of Cyrus and say, here is what Cyrus will do when he comes. How? Why? Uh, Cyrus hasn't even received a name yet. Well, the Almighty God has the power to direct in history so that a little child is born and his mother sitting there deciding what to name the child says, I'll name him Cyrus, fulfilling God's words. And that same child will grow up to do all that God intends for him to do and to reach the positions of power and to make the decisions. And he's going to do exactly what God planned for him to do. Let's put this in another way. I'm back in 2 Peter, and this is the case that we've already looked at before. Peter talking about God moving along those that he used as authors of Scripture. And in context, what's interesting about this passage Uh, Peter talks about being an eyewitness of Jesus' majesty. This is the experience of the transfiguration. And Peter can say, I was one of those, one of three, in fact, right? I received, or when, excuse me, I was there when Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father. I heard the voice, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice from heaven. We were with him on the holy mountain. Here's an interesting just insight or observation about the passage. There are only three people that can say that. I mean, it would have to be Peter, James, or John. One of them has to say they're the only ones that are there. And, and to extend this logic out then, our vision of Scripture goes that from eternity past, God knew and planned that this section of 2 Peter 1 would sound like this. God intended that a person named Peter would write down the words that we were with him and we ourselves heard this voice. God planned all of that out because that's what 2 Peter 1 needed to sound like. And in order to bring that about, God allowed a child to be born and he was named Peter. And he had this experience. He was there. And later, through the sovereignty of God, he wrote down these exact words, saying exactly what God always intended him to say. In fact, we can extend this logic even further out. The specific personality, the style, the writing style, the the logical progressions, even the vocabulary that each one of the authors use, all of that is within the sovereignty of God. All of that is part of his plan. And so I like to imagine Peter, or let's say the, the author of the book of Hebrews, using a very unusual, exotic Greek word. And it's a word that doesn't get used a whole lot. It's kind of an unusual vocabulary word, but it fits that perfectly. And, and from eternity past, God knew and intended that that spot in that place in the argument of the book of Hebrews would use that word. Why? That was the word he wanted to use for that part of his testimony. And so in the providence and sovereignty of God, God prepares an individual an individual who is interested in words like that. And one day, that individual comes across, the author of Hebrews, comes across that vocabulary word. Somebody uses it, and he thinks, oh, that's an interesting word, and he remembers it. And it kind of becomes the habit of the way that he says things. When he goes to that certain idea or that concept, he tends to use that specific word that way. And in the sovereignty of God, then when he comes to that place in the book of Hebrews, and he's writing down God's eternal words. He writes it down, He uses the word God wanted him to use. From eternity past, that was the word. 
and in the sovereignty of God, he did it naturally. He did it in a very human way. He wrote it down. That's the way he talks. That's who he is. That's his habit. And it was also what God from eternity past intended for him to say. The effect of all of this. This ought to give you amazement and awe at the richness of the biblical text. The text is so beautiful and so rich because it brings together, yes, the human elements of actual human authors writing down using their vocabulary, their way of speaking, their way of communicating in normal psychological processes. But in the sovereignty of God, these words are his words. And so when I pick up the text of scripture, I can affirm that in a real place, at a real time, under the pen of an actual human experiencing relatively normal psychological processes, a person wrote down words that in the sovereignty of God were the living words, the eternal words from God himself. This book is a wonder. This book is a miracle. This book shows us the perfect plans of God, the perfect communicator, who has spoken to us in his wisdom, using finite humans to write a perfect word. As we continue in our future lectures, I think we'll continue to be in awe at God's skill in communicating himself clearly. He has sovereignly planned it so that we can know which books are his books. He has sovereignly planned it so that his word is preserved. And he has even intended that his words should be translated and communicated in the languages of the world so that we can hear, read, interpret, understand, and apply to live out God's eternal